let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity today. We ask you to use us. We are ready for the task to live out your commission as given to us in Matthew 28. And we know that John 10, 27 records you saying that my sheep hear my voice. And Lord, we hear your voice. Lord, we hear your call. And we are ready to move with that which will bring a large river of new believers into your spiritual safety net. Take us and use us effectively after this series of three discussions over the next three days. This is a humble prayer that we pray in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. The purpose of these next three meetings is to empower you to use the most effective tool to evangelize. There is no more effective tool than the methodology that we will teach you today, tomorrow, and especially Sabbath. Now, I'm going to give you a bit of a background of how the cell phone evangelism actually developed with us uh, over the last uh, two and a half, three years. And then tomorrow, I'll be talking about something else. And the next day, I will be getting into the actual training and how to do the cell phone evangelism. So this is a bit of background so that you understand where we're coming from, et cetera, et cetera. Now, approximately eight to nine years ago, uh, I was invited to northern Namibia to do a sermon there one weekend. And I went up and I lived with a friend of mine. We were at the seminary together. We graduated together. And uh, I lived with him in his guest house because when he graduated, he went and he became the head of the Namibian religious radio station network in Namibia. And uh, he resigned um, a couple of years after that, maybe 15, 20 years after that. And then he, for the last 20 years, he has had this guest house, which is like a pension fund for him. So I stayed with Neville, my colleague, uh, or my friend at that stage in northern Namibia. And the next morning, the Sabbath morning, we drove the 80 kilometers north to the next town where I was going to preach on the Sabbath morning. And in the car, his wife, Renette, and myself and Neville were discussing the possibility of starting a group. And we decided to start this group. Now, we had no people on this group at that point. So it was only the three of us. It was Neville, Renette, his wife, and myself. Now, I live 2,000 kilometers away in Johannesburg, South Africa. So how do we communicate with each other? So we thought, well, the best, the best would to be to use the WhatsApp platform on our cell phones, which was then sort of just launched. And every morning at 5 o'clock, the three of us would get together and we would pray. We would pray specifically for three things. We said, Lord, please send us people. We don't know anybody, but send us some people. And then number two, we made ourselves available to the Lord to be used. And number three, we said, Lord, we are listening to your calling. Please use us. Send us people. We're making ourselves available. And we are available to, to we are listening to your leading. Well, within a week or two, we had a couple joining us that owned a 7,000 hectare cattle ranch between Omaruru and Ochevarangu in northern Namibia. And uh, well, within a very, very short time, approximately three months or so, we had approximately 70 people on this group. Now, because some of these people were from Ochevarangu, where Neville lives, 500 kilometers north on the Angolan border, and still another 150 kilometers along the Caprivi Strip. That was too far away for us to get together every Sabbath. Some people were down at the coast, 350 kilometers away. Some were down at the capital called Vintuk, which is 245 kilometers away. Some were 800 kilometers south. And I was 2,000 kilometers away. So it is impossible for us as a group to get together every Sabbath morning. So, so what we did is we were continuing to pray every morning at five o'clock. Lord, send us people. Lord, you're making yourselves available. 
Lord, we're listening to your leading. But we then started a Sabbath school pre-program on the WhatsApp platform. So we had a Sabbath school pre-program with a lady that would lead out with a prayer, the mission reading, uh, a song service with one or two songs with background music, etc. We all would sing together. We wouldn't hear each other, but we would sing together. And then uh, we would have a five-minute uh, little sermonette. And then we would have a closing prayer. And then we would have a, a full-on Sabbath school lesson discussion. And then have a couple of minutes break. And then we would have a full-on divine service. We eventually developed and it evolved that we had Sabbath opening on a Friday night and Sabbath closing on a Sabbath evening. So today we have for many years now had this uh, digital church. In fact, we, we, are the, we were the first uh, digital church of all 80,000 congregations around the world and 70,000 home groups around the world. That's 150,000 congregations that we have around the world. We were the first full-on digital church. And about a year and a half ago, our worldwide president, Ted Wilson, actually awarded Neville and myself with the first uh, digital church uh, in, our, in our global community. Well, we decided then in 2013, the beginning of 2013, to actually have our first camp meeting. Well, we could not invite any speakers. We didn't have the funds for that. So I was the one speaker. Neville, my colleague, was the other speaker. And we divided the 14 uh, uh, slots up between the two of us. I had seven, Neville had seven, and it was a great camp meeting. We were only 15 people at our first camp meeting on the 7,000 hectare game, uh, for, uh, uh, sorry, cattle ranch. And uh, so we took our tents and we camped outside and we cleared the farm's uh, uh, storage facility, and that became our hall, our church, where we actually uh, then worshipped the Friday, the Saturday, and the Sunday, Easter weekend of 2013. Well, we did the same in 2014. We did the same in 2015. And in 2015, I was quite uh, sharp. I took a very well-known uh, personality who was a religious uh, singer, a gospel singer in this country, in Southern Africa. I took him with it. Because of that, we had 110 people at our camp meeting in 2015. So it was overflowing. It was really magnificent. Uh, those are very small numbers when it, when it comes to uh, our camp meetings in Johannesburg, which is 7,000 people at a time, or in Cape Town, or in Durban, or whatever. But for us in Namibia, that was absolutely perfect. We then decided to be a bit different. And in 2016 camp meeting, we decided to invite an overseas speaker from America. We then started negotiations uh, 10 months ahead of time. And this person agreed to come and do, be our speaker at our 2016 camp meeting. And a week before the camp meeting, he phoned. <laughs> Something unforeseeable has happened, he says, Gideon and Neville. I cannot come. We said, what? We were shocked. <laughs> Neville and I had prepared nothing. We were waiting for this chap to come. Uh, and uh, he explained the circumstances and we fully understood. And then he said, listen, don't worry, because I found somebody that I'm sending in my place. And I, we said, well, who is he? He said, well, it's a chap called Jonathan Zirkel. We had no idea who Jonathan Zirkel was. Uh, we were hoping it was some big Adventist name, but it wasn't. Uh, anyway, we had to say, yes, send Jonathan Zirkel. <laughs> well, we picked him up at the Vintuk International Airport. Uh, a week later, and he is a fantastic guy, a retired lawyer, a young guy, he's about 40 years of age, he inherited very wealthy from his grandfather, so he's not a lawyer anymore, he does one case a year, just to remain sharp, otherwise he works for the church without salary, and he goes from congregation to congregation on the Sabbath, and he talks about mysticism, and uh, explains to people what is busy happening to all different denominations around the world and also in the Adventist community and how mysticism is creeping into the congregations so that people can recognize it for what it is before it does, is, does any damage. Well, Jonathan Zirkel was the head of Loma Linda University. His father, excuse me, Jonathan Zirkel's father was the head of Loma Linda University, the president. 
uh, and he which he retired many years ago. So the Zirkel name was very famous in California, but we were unaware of it. But Jonathan and Neville and I became big friends. And then when I, after the camp meeting, uh, I came back to Johannesburg and Neville took him to one of the game parks called Itosha. And they really had a wonderful time for a couple of days. He saw some elephants and lions and, and, uh, uh, and everything, cheetahs, uh, leopards, uh, really had a good time. Well, what we did not know is the Lord was busy leading. The Lord was busy playing a chess game, putting certain people into certain positions, causing certain relationships to form for a specific reason. And what happened there is Jonathan got involved with total member involvement, TMI. In the beginning of 2017, they planned a massive evangelistic series in Central Europe which was not Russia and not Germany and France and those areas. It was sort of Central uh, Europe, which is uh, Poland down to Georgia, Armenia, that central area. And uh, Jonathan was given the task of Georgia and Armenia, etc., etc. And he became aware of some ex-South Africans that were busy farming in the Georgia state. And he thought, well, he knows two South Africans why doesn't he contact Gideon and Neville and ask them to become involved in TMI in Central Europe the end of January, the beginning of February, February 2017? Well, I could not go because of other pressures and obligations I'd already had, but Neville felt obliged to go because of our friendship with Jonathan Zirkel. Well, there were 4,200 evangelistic campaigns simultaneously per day for a two-week period in Central Europe. And they got uh, a lot of Adventists, lay people, uh, not necessarily qualified ministers, to give up two weeks of their lives, bring their laptops, and the first day they were given these 18 sermons of Mark Finley. They were given these 18 sermons in a in very impressive software that was written by Adventist World Radio, AWR, for this specific purpose, because TMI and AWR is technically the same department with the same head. The same president is running both of them. So um, AWR wrote this program, and the first day, these 4,200 people received the sermons, and they were shown how the software works. It's phenomenal, because you will see the notes in English on your laptop. And your interpreter standing next to you will then actually see the notes in his language. And the, the audience will see it in a possibly another language. So you can choose whatever combination of languages you wish. <laughs> it really is impressive. And, uh, well, they had this campaign. And uh, Neville and I phone each other a few times every single day. And he phoned me, he says, Gideon, today we received the 18 sermons and we got it on our laptops and we were showing how the software works. And we're starting with our first evangelistic campaign this evening. And that evening after the first campaign, he phoned me, he says, Gideon, I obviously prepared and read through the, the, the PowerPoints this afternoon. And I presented this evening and I'm so impressed with these Mark Finley sermons. Wow, I think these are fantastic. The next evening he phones me again, he says, Gideon, We've just done number two. I'm more impressed. The next evening he phones me again. Gideon, we've just done number three. I'm even more impressed. In fact, Gideon, is your seatbelt tight? <laughs> I said, yes, fire away. He says, Gideon, when I get back to Johannesburg or to Namibia, we're going to translate this into the local Afrikaans language. And we're going to try the same thing, but on our WhatsApp group. We're going to try and send these messages out on WhatsApp and see what happens. We'll have a little campaign. We'll just put our toe in the water and see if, if it works. Maybe it will flop. Maybe it won't work. Well, Neville got back. We translated all the, uh, the, the sermons, the 18 sermons, into the local Afrikaans language, which is, which is a major Southern African language spoken mainly in South Africa and in Namibia. And... Um, it's a language which, is, which comes from Holland and German and a bit of French, it's, but it's 95% Dutch. Uh, but it's changed slightly over the last 200 years. 
in any case so we went to our 72 members on our whatsapp group our church in namibia our group we were not a church yet we were just a group we went to our 72 members and we said listen we're going to give you three days we want you to go onto your cell phone and look in your contacts and see which are non-adventists and we want you to contact each person and then say to them do you understand the book of revelation and they will say no and when they say no you say listen i'm aware of a very easy to understand series of meetings that you receive privately in your phone once a week and uh, you've got seven days to go through those six voice notes and you can listen to a voice note while you go to work in the car you can listen while you are walking and jogging with earphones uh, whatever but you've got seven days to listen and master that first study before you receive study number two etc etc well we were absolutely amazed because three days later we had 1300 willing participants that 72 people actually harvested and these were Afrikaans speaking people from mainly South Africa and Namibia, but many from Australia, many from New Zealand, a few from Japan, a few from South Korea, many from Europe, the States, England, one or two from South America. We were absolutely amazed, 1,300 people. These were names we've never seen before. And uh, at the end of the series, uh, we baptized 350 people. That amazed us. How is it possible to evangelize with 1,300 people and we end up with a figure of 350 people? Something went wrong. <laughs> so we sent out a four little question questionnaire to these 1,300 people. We, we asked them certain questions. We then realized when we got the answers that these recipients were sending these studies on to friends and colleagues at work and family members all over the globe speaking Afrikaans. Well, one person sent it to 22 of her friends religiously uh, every week. So, so if the average was 10, if 1,300 people sent out 10, sent out these sermons which they received to 10 of their friends, we were reaching an audience of 13,000 people plus the 1,300, 14,300 people now the figure of 350 baptisms made sense. That really was a well. That really opened up our eyes like we've never, we, we then realized, wow, what have we got here? This is unbelievable. Now, I'm a second generation Adventist. My father was a full-time evangelist his whole life. He was an academic. He wrote about a dozen books. And he had six pastors working with him full-time. And they would have, that was way ahead of the days of television. So he would rent the biggest theater in Cape Town or Johannesburg or Durban or Bloemfontein. And uh, the biggest theater those days was called the Alhambra Theater or the Coliseum. There was no TV in the country yet. So on Sunday, all, everything was closed. All the theaters were available to be rented for religious purposes, which we could do. But otherwise, because this is a Calvinistic country, or then it was, all businesses and everything was closed on a Sunday. So my father with these six pastors would take a one-year evangelistic campaign, and they would spend two, three months preparing, let's say, Cape Town for this massive evangelistic campaign. And they would, every Sabbath, go to the churches and take packs of pamphlets and have potluck after, uh, after the sermon, then go out with the, the church members and put these under windscreen wipers in parking lots and hand them out to people every single Sabbath for weeks before the time, make print big uh, posters. My father had a printing press in his double garage and all the pastors would work there during the week printing these things, et cetera, and then putting them up onto the lampposts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then they would rent this biggest theater and have four sessions on a Sunday. 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock. And the theaters, I was a little kid. The theaters were absolutely packed, not a seat open. And um, it was the old, well-known series, Dead Men Do Tell Tales. Some of the older people might remember that series that my father uh, 
uh, used in South Africa and also around the world. And uh, then they would have this every single Sunday. And after a couple of months ago, they might only have one session on a Sunday as people start falling out, et cetera. And eventually to the very big, a big hall and then eventually to the church. And after a nine month evangelistic campaign where the whole thing took 10 months or 11 months or 12 months in total uh, with the, pre pre the preparation time before that, they might baptize between 80 and 90 people. Now, if you took the salaries of six pastors plus my father, you took the cost of all the printing, the paper and the ink, you took the cost of renting those halls, those big theaters, et cetera, et cetera, advertising in the local newspapers, that today would be 100,000 US dollars easily, very, very easily for 80 or 90 baptisms. When we realized that we baptized 350 people after a year and we spent about $100 on data, I tell you what, our eyes opened wide. <laughs> we said, Lord, what have we got here? This is the way to go. This is the way to go forward. So that was the beginning of, of what has developed into the most successful evangelism, evangelistic campaign possible. Now I would like to explain to you how the Lord works even more astoundingly. At the same time, a person called Dr. Dwayne McKee, that we had no idea who he was, never heard this name before. He happens to be the president of Adventist World Radio, but we, Neville and I had never heard of him. Him and his wife, Kathy, were planning a TMI for Zambia. And they were flying out a year ahead of, the, of time to start planning with the local conferences, the local union, uh, etc., because they need to have small evangelistic campaigns to prepare people for baptisms. Then we come with the TMI for two weeks, and then we've got a reaping harvest of uh, thousands of people. That is what the plan is with TMI. So Dwayne and Kathy were busy flying to and fro from uh, Washington, from our head office in GC uh, to, uh, uh, um, to Zambia to start organizing an evangelistic campaign in two cities, one in Lusaka, which is the capital, and one campaign in Livingston, which is at Victoria Waterfalls. And because Vic Livingston is a smaller city, but the second biggest city, they ended up having about 80 evangelistic campaigns per day, eight zero, but Lusaka had 1,000, 1,000 evangelistic campaigns simultaneously per day in one city for a two-week period. Well, I'll tell you how the Lord works, because when they wanted to go to Livingston again, and they picked up the phone to actually book the, 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 the hotel, they said, Livingston is chock and block. There's not one bed available in Livingston. We don't know what's happened, but this, there's an influx of tourists. There's not one bed available in Livingston. Well, that hotel and they themselves from Washington got onto the internet and they started searching for the nearest possible double bed to Livingston. <laughs> well, they eventually found one called Falcon Lodge, which was quite a few kilometers, 20, 30, 40 kilometers outside along the Zambezi River. Uh, quite a few kilometers away from Livingston. And late that evening, this open Land Rover came to pick them up at the Livingston airport. And uh, the sun had already set. And uh, these Americans were thinking, well, there's lions here, there's elephants here. And Lord, why have you allowed us to be in this open Land Rover? And uh, this, this is Africa. This is dangerous. Please protect us. And the road was a very bumpy dirt road. They said, Lord, why did you allow this to happen? this uncomfortable Land Rover, this open tourist Land Rover, there's lions and elephants everywhere. And now we've got this bumpy road and eventually they got to Falcon Lodge. And as they walk into register and sign in the register, uh, they see this lady sitting behind the counter. And they realize she's listening to something on the cell phone. And as they come closer, they see the Bible is open. She's listening and the Bible is open. And she's sitting there and is puffing away on the cigarette. <laughs> and she welcomes Dwayne and Kathy and they sign in and they get to bed. And the next morning after breakfast, they come to settle their bill. And there she's sitting again, smoking away, listening on her cell phone with the Bible open. <laughs> well, Dwayne couldn't 
hold himself in anymore. He couldn't control himself anymore. He, says, he said, Annette, Antoinette, what are you listening to? And she said to him, man, I'm listening to an Afrikaans because Duane couldn't understand their language. I'm listening to some Bible studies on the book of Revelation in Afrikaans. Well, when she said Revelation, <laughs> Duane almost fainted because only the Adventists talk about Revelation. Nobody, the, all the other denominations technically avoid the book of Revelation. So he said to her, who is this guy? And he, she says, she doesn't know him. She received these studies from her cousin in the Cape, in Cape Town. He sends it up and she, the guy's name is Neville, but she doesn't know who Neville is. Well, eventually she got hold of Neville's telephone number, gave it to Duane. And when Duane was back in, Los, uh, in uh, Washington three days later, he phoned Neville and he says, Neville, I'm Duane McKee. Neville had no idea who Duane McKee was. Well, after 20 minutes, uh, they knew each other very well. And Duane McKee actually gave us his credit card over the telephone. And he said, go and buy Gideon and Neville some decent equipment to do the recordings. Because then I'd started recording Revelation of Hope for the World Church in English. And he gave us his credit card. He never met us. Doesn't know what we look like. We don't know what Duane looks like. We don't know if he's short or fat or thin or what. <laughs> we spent 5,000 US dollars buying two computers, buying microphones and all the equipment that we needed. Uh, absolutely unbelievable. Uh, it's amazing how the Lord leads. I mean, can you imagine how the Lord caused us to get to become friends with a chap, Jonathan Zirkel, who becomes the, one of the organizers in Central Europe, invites Neville and myself. There, Neville is exposed to Mark Finley's uh, series, evangelistic series. He comes back and we experiment with it. And we are hyper successful. At the same time, uh, Dwayne McKee walks into Livingston and discovers, and discovers somebody receiving the messages that Neville had, re had recorded. That is how the Lord leads. Absolutely unbelievable. Well, three months later, Neville was invited to go to Washington where he spent three days. Um, uh, after three months, he spent three days there from the 19th to the 22nd of September, 2017. And there they were, were asking him all sorts of questions, uh, etc. How did you and Gideon develop this? How do you work? Uh, then they realized that he was for 17 years head of an, a, a radio station in uh, Namibia. Uh, and AWR is a radio station organization. And they were absolutely thrilled that Neville's got all the radio experience and also computer experience and all the other things that put him into a situation where he thought out the, the, the idea of self and evangelism. My friend, the church leadership were so enthusiastically uh, encouraged when they met Neville that they actually decided to close the GC one afternoon at three o'clock and get all the staff to come down to the auditorium where they asked Neville to actually do a presentation to them on what him and Gideon are doing in Southern Africa with self and evangelism. And uh, the next morning, they had a breakfast session with Neville at the Hilton, which is very, it's about a kilometer or so away from the GC head office. And there, they asked Neville a few questions. And Neville very quickly realized that the leadership of AWR, Adventist World Radio, of AWR are so dynamic. They, wanted, they want to roll out cell phone evangelism as quickly as possible to every single congregation around the world, to all 13 divisions and all unions and all 150,000 home groups and congregations around the world as quickly as possible. So we need to do this, friend. We need to move with this as soon as we possibly can. We've got very little time in our hands. This year, 2020, tells us that the Lord's coming is around the corner. And there are only two more things that have to happen before the Lord can come. Number one is the gospel to all the world then the Lord can come. Number two, the rejection of Ellen White. That's very clear in the book of Revelation. So um, those things are about to happen and then the Lord will come. So you and I are commissioned. If you look at Matthew chapter 28, where the great commission is explained in verses 19 and 20, 
you and I have to move and we have to move fast. Uh, in, 29, in 2009, approximately 11 years ago, a chap by the name of Jan Koom lost his job at Yahoo. And he went home and he wrote a program which he launched four months later, which is called WhatsApp. And four years later, he was paid 19 billion US dollars for WhatsApp. He now still is part of the team at WhatsApp, which is owned now by Facebook. They've, in, in, uh, at that stage, in uh, 2013, they had 400 million users in the first four years. They were growing at a remarkable 560,000 new participants per day, not per month, not per week, per day. 560,000 participants per day. In 2018, they had an active user amount of 1.5 billion people daily. With, uh, with, uh, uh, now today, we've got about 2.2 billion users every single day. An average of 70 to 80 billion messages are sent per day. It's a massive success worldwide. In South Africa and in most of Africa, we have discovered that 70% of people that own a cell phone also have WhatsApp. The reason for that is cell phone calls are quite expensive in Africa versus America. And uh, with WhatsApp, the calls are free, it's just a little bit of data. So it became an instant hit in Africa. Uh, there are more than 1 billion groups on WhatsApp. And uh, where Facebook today uh, has changed the social media platform of the world with 2.4, 2.5 billion users, WhatsApp has changed the way that we communicate. It really is an unbelievable way to send and receive messages, to send and receive images, pictures. We now electronically can speak to each other's revolutionized communication. And also the way that we do business has changed because of WhatsApp. There's now WhatsApp business, small business and big business, uh, which is now being done via this platform, which has also changed the world dramatically. So if you look at Google Play or Apple iTunes, where you download uh, software and uh, et cetera, et cetera, it's the biggest downloaded app, app, at, uh, application. Uh, by far, it remains the most popular thing. So today, my friend, the telephone is king. This is king. Most users do everything on their cell phones. I cannot remember when last I've been to a bank, inside a bank, because I do everything on my smartphone. I do the internet. I use it as a telephone. I use it as a GPS to go to an address. I receive and send messages on it. I receive free uh, and make uh, free WhatsApp calls around the world. I do business on this phone. 99% of people are never without their cell phones. Never. Where's your Bible now? Possibly at home on your pedestal. But where's your cell phone? On you? <laughs> That's reality. <laughs> Nothing wrong with what I said. That's reality. So my friend, in this modern time, if you want to reach someone, there's no more effective way than to reach him or her through their cell phone. There's no more effective way. I'm going to repeat this. In this modern time, if you want to reach someone, there is no more effective way than to reach someone, somebody on their cell phone. So this really is a very, very effective tool to use today. You see, what has happened in the last couple of years, we've been launching um, as a global community uh, approximately 2,000 satellites that hover between 100 and 140 kilometers above the crust of the Earth, and they hover in those static positions, and they form this communication blanket which we call a digital communication blanket around the world. And this is why when you phone somebody on the other side of the globe, five seconds later, the phone rings there on the other side of the globe. Digitally, this whole world is now connected. Digitally, we are all connected with each other. All 215 countries on this globe are connected. There are no more walls, no more borders. No more barriers. This digital blanket connects all of us together. It really is amazing. And when you look at my father, that was a full-time evangelist, we had a budget of 100,000 US dollars a year 
for an evangelistic campaign and he baptizes 80 or 90 people per year and we spent $100 and baptized 350, it tells you that the traditional system of evangelism does not compare with digital evangelism. My friend, in the last 2,000 years, listen up, listen carefully. In the last 2,000 years, from the time that Jesus walked on this earth till today, you and I have the unique privilege to be part of this first generation that is actually in a position to finish this work. Digitally, this whole world is now connected. So if each and every one of you can embrace cell phone evangelism, we will literally finish this work within a very, very short time. Now, time is very limited. You and I need to get this ball rolling in Nigeria as soon as possible. And if you are from another country, as soon as possible. And our head office at G, uh, at, in Washington, our GC, they know this. And there's tremendous urgency. And remember that very soon, religious activity will be stopped. Now, I'm in charge of the whole of Africa, all three divisions, and India, and Nepal, and Indonesia. So I do those uh, four and a half divisions of our 13 divisions around the world. Neville does England, uh, Europe, Russia, Japan, Asia. Um, so I'm very aware of what's happening in my territory. And uh, I went to Nepal last year this time. It was this specific weekend. I was in Nepal training the Nepalese for cell phone evangelism. I then discovered that on the 18th of August, 2018, it became a criminal offense to evangelize over social media in Nepal. Now, Nepal is a country between India and China, where the highest mountain in the world is Mount Everest. I actually flew to Mount Everest, a quest that I had for many, many years, not to climb it, to fly there. <laughs> I am a bit of a mountaineer, but that's a bit, that's a bit out of my league. <laughs> in any case, um, Many countries, 99% of all the countries around the world have now, ha now have legislation in place to regulate social media. So it will be very easy for them to stop any religious activity like Nepal has and like Russia have. Um, right, so it's, you are invited today with this introductory chat to commit yourself to cell phone evangelism and I will teach you to get your congregation members to participate with training. And I would, like you, I would like to encourage you to get as many people to join us tomorrow. We only, what is it, 25 people with 180 million people in your country. We want at least a zero behind that tomorrow. Can I, can I, can I challenge you? <laughs> Uh, uh, the Nigerians that I know in South Africa are very wide awake, very sharp people. So if I give you this challenge, let me see what the Nigerians are made of. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit naughty. I'm a bit naughty. Right, I want to give you a couple of examples. One of our congregations. Sorry, somebody, can they just regulate the sound? Can somebody just put everybody off? Right, somebody, microphone went on. Whoever's controlling this, please, guys, whoever's controlling, get everybody's microphones off except mine. It's very easy to do that. Very easy to do that. Somebody's microphone is on. Or Lusagun, your microphone is on. Right. Sorry about that. Sometimes what happens, it's not necessarily Lusagun's fault. Sometimes what happens is you lose connection and you come back again and it switches itself on. So watch your connection very carefully, please. I will appreciate that. Um, a very small town in a certain <laughs> area of South Africa. Okay, guys. Uh, I wish I was made a co-host and I would do something about this. Right. Tomorrow I'll make sure that I'm a co-host. You're a co-host, sir. Right. Only be you. Your microphone is on. 
Right. Um, at a small congregation in South Africa, there was an Australian that settled there from a, an Adventist from, from Australia. And he came with this nonsense that we need to still have the feasts in the Adventist church, the flat earth theory, and the Holy Spirit is not part of the Trinity. Well, the congregation was about 45 members, and they split down the middle, and the head elder and 22 of the members were worshiping in the head elder's home. And we were asked to actually go down there and try and save this remaining uh, portion of the congregation and train them in evangelism, et cetera, et cetera. So Neville and I went down and uh, we trained those 22 members with only seven active members in that church. The rest were elderly, retired people. Only seven members. After a two-week period of them evangelizing a month later after we trained them, they had 34 people in a small town interested. They had three sessions a day at TMI, three sessions a day, three evangelistic campaigns per day in different areas in the city, in the little village, excuse me, the little town. And they had 34 people interested a month later, which they put onto a WhatsApp group that received the Revelation of Hope studies, and that made their congregation eventually even bigger than what they started off with. My brother, three years ago, at that point, was an elder for one of the biggest churches in Pretoria for 33 years. And he said to me, Gideon, when I look at the, at the church, there's nobody here that's baptized because of me being an elder. I'm going to resign. I said to him, don't resign. Here's a, here's a CD. I just started recording Revelation of Hope. And I think I had three sermons on a CD. And I gave it to my brother. And I said to him, listen to that and phone me tomorrow. He phoned me the next day. He says, Gideon, what do I do with this? I said, do me a favor, take your cell phone, identify 10 contacts that are non-Adventists, approach each one eyeball to eyeball physically and say to them, do you understand the book of Revelation? And they would say, no. And you say, I'm aware of a very easy to understand, uh, series, understand uh, series of Revelation that's very easy to understand that you receive privately in your phone in either English or the local other Afrikaans language. You receive it one a week and you take your own Bible and follow the study. And after a couple of weeks, you will really get to grips with the book that is written for the end times. Well, I tell you, uh, on the 27th of September, 2017, Mario started with one group with nine people on one group, nine people. And a week later, he had another 20 or so forming a second group. A week later, had another 20 or so forming a, a third group. And after five weeks, I actually interviewed him for AWR. And he had five groups with 192 people in total. Well, Marius' first baptism was his eldest son that used to be a drug addict. That was his first baptism, March the next year. Subsequently, he's had dozens in the period of the last two years, dozens of baptisms. He's not resigned as an elder, but this has become his passion. He's one of our su most successful 60,000 cell phone evangelists that we've trained around the world. He's one of our most successful cell phone evangelists. Uh, I would like to share with you that the work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite the efforts with those of ministers and church officers. That is Testimonies, Volume 9, page 117. I see this is being recorded. So you are welcome to order this recording, but you're also welcome to make a note. Testimonies, Volume 9, page 117. The work of, this on, oh, the work of God on this earth can never be finished until the ordinary church member starts evangelizing. That is what she's saying. Um, the context with this next chat uh, this next quotation is Matthew 28, our Great Commission. Not upon the ordained minister only rests the responsibility of going forth to fulfill this commission. It is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of soul saving depends alone on the ordained ministry. God will send forth into his vineyard many who have not been dedicated to the ministry by the laying on of hands. That's Acts of the Apostles, page 110. Acts of the Apostles, page 110. My friend, you cannot leave the ministry or evangelism to the ordained ministry only. 
Uh, it's very important that the normal member gets involved. The normal member will finish the work. And then another quotation, we are nearing the close of this Earth's history. And in 2020, we're very aware of that. We are nearing the close of this Earth's history. We have before us a great work. The closing work of giving the last warning message to a sinful world. There are men who will be taken from the plow. The plow means ordinary workers. Men from the vineyard, ordinary workers from various branches of work. Plumbers, carpenters, mechanics, bookkeepers, accountants will be sent forth by the Lord to give this message to the world. Evangelism, page 48. So my friend, I will teach you tomorrow and especially on Sabbath afternoon how to evangelize. Remember Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 says two things. Go and make disciples and then teach them. They go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So make disciples and teach them. That is your commission. So you will be after Sabbath. You will be entrusted with this truth. You will be fully equipped. You will be commissioned to react. You can then, after this weekend, become active in service. And you will be able to reach and teach other people as well to do the same. God will move upon men in humble positions to declare the message of present truth. Testimonies, volume 7, page 26. God will move upon men in humble positions to declare the message of present truth. This will be done by housewives, by mechanics, by plumbers, by electricians, by accountants. Men in humble positions will actually finish this work. If you take the parable of the Good Samaritan, recognizing love to God and man as the sum of righteousness, uh, he had said, do this and thou shalt live. And the Samaritan had obeyed the dictates of a kind and a loving heart. And in this had proved himself a doer of the law. And cried, uh, Christ bade the lawyer, go and do thou likewise. So my friend, doing and not merely saying, not merely sitting in the church once a week, but doing is expected of the children of God. He that said, uh, he that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk even as Christ walked. 1 John 2 verse 6. How did Christ walk on this earth? He didn't, he didn't even own a donkey or a, or a bicycle or a motor car. He didn't even own a house, not even a shack. He came to this earth. He, uh, he evangelized among the lowest of people and spent time with God in the mountain in private devotions and spent time with the people, helping them, healing them, leading them to the gospel. My friend, Christians are to represent Christ. And now this is a very hard statement. Please forgive me, it's not me. I'm quoting Ellen White. Unless there is a practical self-sacrifice for the good of others in your family circle, in your neighborhood, in your church, wherever you may be, then whatever your profession, you are not a Christian. My friend, unless there is a practical self-sacrifice for the good of others, you are not living out your great commission. That is Desire of Ages, my favorite book, page 504. 504. Christ has linked his interest with that of humanity. And he asks you to become one with him for the saving of humanity. Freely you have received, I'm adding the word salvation, freely give salvation to others, Matthew 10 verse 8. That is Desire of Ages, page 504. My friend, tomorrow you will understand that we are at a turning point as a worldwide church, as the biggest Protestant community in the world. We are at a turning point. And we are inviting you to take hands with AWR, Adventist World Radio, and let's finish the work together. Now, we've trained many churches. We trained a lady in Northern uh, America, and we trained somebody in South America that 
they're doing the, all the, the, the Latin uh, speaking countries, uh, Spanish, etc. And then North America is the English. Neville is doing, as I said, Europe and that I'm doing Africa and Indonesia, uh, etc. So over the last couple of years, Neville and I have trained many, many areas in many, many parts of the world, as well as outside of our territory, uh, etc. But when we had the pleasure of uh, visiting the general conference and attending the annual council, etc., etc., we also then took the opportunity to train five North American congregations where we also trained this lady that became a trainee. And uh, at the end of that training session, Mark Finley, uh, actually got up because one of those five churches was his own church. So we went and trained Mark Finley's own church. And Pastor Mark got up and he said at the end of the training session, this is the greatest, most effective evangelism tool ever available to mankind that we will start using in this congregation immediately. And he implemented, implemented it in his congregation. Um, I will give you a link at the end of Sabbath where you will be able to see this video of Pastor Ted Wilson, where he says cell phone evangelism is the way to finish this work. His exact words is, this is the last frontier to cross. Digital evangelism is the way forward. Um, my friend, no one can live the law of God without ministering to others. What is the law of God? The Ten Commandments, love to God and love to man. That's the law of God. You cannot live the love of God that you've received and give the love onward to the others. Give the baton that you've received on to others without, without ministering. You cannot live the law of God without ministering to others. That's Desire of Ages 584. You will discover that Desire of Ages is my favorite book. <laughs> no one can live the law of God without ministering to others. Desire of Ages 584. And you are invited today Let's get the participants. Let's put a zero behind this 22 or whatever it is at the moment. Let's get 100, 200, 300 people involved here tomorrow, please. Um, and especially on Sabbath. Let's get the ball rolling. I believe there are 180 million citizens in, in Nigeria with only a handful of Adventists. So we need to really get hold of, uh, of, your, of your country. We need to grab it by the horns. And for the last couple of months, we've had a fantastic team organized by one of the participants here, OK. Um, and OK has organized the Revelation of Hope series to be translated into, I think, four of your major languages, Yoruba, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Four of your major languages. I don't, don't remember all the languages' names anymore. I will explain all of that to you tomorrow or definitely on Saturday, on Sabbath. So um, I would like to now end off. Uh, are there any questions? I don't know if there's somebody... That...